Okay, here's your uh, analysis video of Sandra Cisneros' uh, collection of short stories called Woman Hollering Creek. Uh, we'll be looking at uh, a few of the short stories you've read, looking for themes, uh, looking for a little bit more uh, analysis and comparison to those three iconic female figures I mentioned to you in the last video. Uh, just to recap, we're looking at Cisneros' book in uh, the category of Chicana or Latina writing. And if I didn't mention it in the previous video, the movement for Mexican-American civil rights in the United States really gains a different kind of steam in the 60s and 70s going by the name of the Chicano movement, um, very specifically concentrating on the next generation beyond the World War II era, Mexican Americans who are seeking to fully uh, identify as, as their Mexican ancestral upbringing and as their American influenced identity as well. So this, this uh, sort of combination of cultures, languages, uh, and ethnicities brings a, a new concept, um, well not a new concept, but strengthens the concept that has been there in, and turns it into a more significantly positive or beneficial identity referred to as the Chicano. It, it has power, it has social awareness, it has um, a push for, for change and for, for validity and to be able to live at, as both uh, in, in conjunction with one's Mexican identity and one's American identity. And um, this really takes place towards the latter part of the 1960s into the 70s and, and everything that comes after political, cultural, or artistic uh, has this as its sort of um, influential point. Uh, speaking back to it, maybe growing from it, etc. And when Sandra Cisneros and, and others who began to write during the 1980s, uh, when they they use this as a moment of influence, what they're looking for is is a way to insert their their own particular upbringing as Chicanos and Chicanas, um, how it's very unique and perspective driven, inserting that into an artistic expression, something that is reflective of the way that they know the world and, and that they've seen the world. And I mentioned in the, the bio video to Cisneros that she grew up and was born in Chicago, spent time in Mexico, and then ultimately um, lived in San Antonio, Texas, sort of an in-between uh, the two for a majority uh, of her life. And in fact, I believe only recently has moved from there. But um, so this idea of, of culturally in between or culturally moving back and forth is a very big idea in, in the writing of Mexican Americans slash Chicanos uh, in the 1980s, 90s, and, and it's sort of evolving into something else now. Um, so she writes these stories in a, in a way that, that sort of mixes cultural identities in and is very, very um, unique to Chicanos and Chicanas. And she also does this by looking specifically at the women. In the introduction video, I mentioned that, that, that the, the patriarchal sense of cultural identity that, that Mexican-American culture or Latino culture exhibits, she and other writers also, but she in our book is looking to subvert that and, and 
you know, sort of, t number one, identify it. Number two, sort of dig out where it comes from, how it's taught. And number three, begin to sort of see ways that we can flip it around and undermine it. Um, I mentioned in the last video also this figure known as La Llorona, the weeping woman, with whom this book is sort of in, in, in conversation. Um, now the story of La Llorona is, is a folk tale. It's an oral history story that has been sort of told for, for a long time, and in a little bit different ways, but with some, some sort of common elements in all the versions of the story. I'm going to share that with you, uh, but I also want to uh, bring up two other female figures that, that are important as well to understand, and this is going to back to the other woman I mentioned in the video from last time and, and a link I've posted on your Blackboard site to a woman named Gloria Ansaldúa who during the 1980s wrote a book that was very famous in terms of Mexican-American Chicano history but also very specifically for women amongst uh, that sort of cultural history as well called Borderlands La Frontera and in this book, she mentions these, these three female figures. La Llorona is one of them. Uh, but the other two she mentions are, are also influential in, in women learning to be um, what their culture sort of deems appropriate for them. And those figures are La Melinche and La Virgen de Guadalupe, or the Virgin of Guadalupe. Um, these figures, before I tell you about La Llorona, these figures are, are sort of historical slash mythical um, icons of femininity within uh, Mexican-American history and Mexican history, in, in fact. La Melinche is based on the, the real historical figure um, who was an Aztec woman befriended by Cortez as his lover and his translator and who throughout history has oftentimes been positioned as a cultural race traitor, somebody who betrayed her people and, and allowed for, for the, um, what's the word I'm looking for, for the domination of the of the Spanish conquerors over the Aztecs and allowed for this to happen, enabled this to happen. And in fact, was more than likely not the case that she betrayed or, or gave her herself over willingly, completely, and, and turned her back on her people. This has been sort of misconstrued throughout history. And what Ansaldúa says in her book is that more than likely the Aztecs had enough local enemies that the Spanish were able to convince to help them that this and sickness and all these other things led more to the destruction of that. So, so La Melinche exists as this figure of, of treacherous womanhood, the idea that, that women are conniving and duplicitous and, and will turn their back on their own people in a sort of sexually deviant way. And this, this has been the way that La Melinche has been depicted historically as a female figure. Okay, The other female figure that I mentioned, La Virgen de Guadalupe, the version of Guadalupe, is probably more famous and, and you may know the picture if not the story. Um, in short, the story has to do with the 16th century young boy by the name of Juan Diego uh, wandering through the through uh, the 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 valley and the hill in in a small village and or outside a small village and coming across a vision of a woman, a holy vision he feels, and he feels overpowered by the vision, and the woman tells him to to go to the local bishop, who is a man who has come over from Spain, uh, and build a church in her honor at this place. 
And so the young boy, who is either an Indian boy or a mestizo boy, meaning he's mixed between uh, Indian and Spanish, he goes to the Sp Spanish bishop. Understand that this is in, in um, the New World. This bishop has come over from Spain. Uh, and he tells him, he says, you know, Bishop, we are to build a church here. This, this, you know, mysterious woman told me that. And the bishop then asks the boy to get a sign from this woman who, when he goes back, Juan Diego goes back and tells the woman this. And she gives him uh, orders to go and pick some flowers, put them in his co cloak, and take them to the bishop as a sign uh, that, that she is speaking directly to him. And he takes these flowers back and uh, ultimately drops them in front of the bishop and on, imprinted on his cloak is this beautiful uh, vision uh, in the, the, the garb that we're most familiar with in terms of the blue and white and the yellow uh, and the green and the stars uh, surrounding this this virgin image uh, and of course this figure the virgin of guadalupe becomes very very important in mexican and mexican-american culture because it's it's a vision of uh, catholic femininity specifically directed at uh, the mestizos the mexican slash mexican-american people and it, it helps the Spanish sort of spread their Catholicism to the indigenous people in the area because of that. Now, this figure uh, then becomes the component of female identity that has to do with chastity and purity and, and wholesomeness uh, and, and sanctity, right? This is a Marian apparition that serves to influence an entire culture. Okay, so on the one hand, you have the La Melinche figure who represents, you know, the duplicitous, treacherous nature of women. And the other hand, you have um, the figure of a virgin who represents purity and piousness, uh, both that should influence or have influenced a cultural identity. And so between the two, what you get is sometimes what, what academics will call a virgin slash whore uh, binary, going back and forth between the two. Uh, female identity is oftentimes, you know, s uh, simplified to this sort of binary. Okay? And the third figure, and, and Ansel Dua is mentioning all of these in her book, the third figure that she says uh, has been, you know, sort of, an ingredient in Latina identity is this figure known as La Llorona, the weeping woman. And the story, as I mentioned a little bit ago, is, is various. You know, it, ha it has different, um, uh, different ingredients no matter how you tell it. But the core of the story is is the same in all of them and I'll give you a sort of watered down version of the story and it's just that I mean whether it's based on true events or anything like that it's you know that's long since been erased from the story itself the story begins with a young beautiful girl in a small village the most beautiful girl in the village very sort of um, we would say today she's full of herself and knows that she's beautiful and feels as if all the men around know she's beautiful as well. And so she decides that she is going to um, marry the most handsome man in the local area because it's only rightfully so. And so she, she makes her decision and brings the man close into her ways and begins to flirt with him and attract him. And they're married because, you know, again, according to how you tell the story, because the woman has, you know, beguiled him and she knows what to do as a woman. Um, 
in terms of emotions and how to play with man's uh, hearts, etc. This is the way that the story goes. And, and they are married and they have two children and they start uh, a young and, and, you know, sort of successful life together. But as they get older, the man gets a wandering eye and a, a wandering heart and he begins to leave on more and more trips uh, to, you know, whatever reason you want to put in there into the story to, to fulfill his business needs, etc. But he stays away longer and he stays away longer and one time he doesn't come back. And... Uh, until he comes back and he has a newer, younger girl sitting alongside him on his wagon, his, you know, bit of travel, whatever. Uh, and they come back and they say hi to his, his children and ignore his first wife completely. He has essentially replaced his first wife with a new version of her, a younger version of her. And again, details. The details change in, in however you tell the story. But because of this, the first wife, the woman, uh, is emotionally driven to extreme rage and cannot control herself because she has defined herself by being wanted by all these these men and getting the man that she wanted and now that this is no longer the case she is unable to cope she has lost connection with logic she is rage filled anger jealousy you know crazy manic behavior and she is so angry at her husband that she sees her children that she has with him and she takes them down to the creek and she drowns them because she's she's very spiteful and she she wants all of him destroyed and after doing this she sort of comes back down from this craze and realizes that she's drowned her children too they're not just his children and she begins to to weep uncontrollably to sob deep heavy sobs very emotional um, moment because she realized that that she can't control her actions and and because of this was driven crazy and was left to wander the creek bank up and down crying moaning moaning and crying and sobbing uncontrollably and um, the message here is that she was, was so susceptible to emotional um, lack of control that she went from rage and jealousy completely to sadness and, d and depression and she therefore exists as a story of a, a woman's inability to control their emotional output. This is the sort of meta message beyond that. And then, of course, it makes for a good ghost story because that figure of the wandering, weeping woman exists in, in ghost form as well. You say that, that out in the dark on, you know, nights where, where you hear a moaning sound or a or a unexplainable, you know, roar, or, or just whatever in the dark. Sometimes that could be the sounds of La Llorona, and she's out looking for, for children, and so she exists in that way as well. So if you put all these three figures together, La Llorona, this this mother turned, um, you know, uh, scorned wife, etc., and then La Melinche, the, the, the sexually deviant betrayer, and La Virgen, the pure, you know, sanctimonious um, sacredness of the female. You can see what Ansaldúa is doing in, in positioning these three sort of iconic figures as, you know, informed ingredients of what Latina identity should be. Uh, and she says that that's very limiting. And in fact, 
she, the other thing she says is that these three figures have influenced Latinas uh, to, to understand, and Latinos as well, that in their culture, this means that, that for, for Latina women to leave the house, uh, they had to sort of fulfill one of these roles. They had to you know get married and become a mother. Uh, they had to jo uh, join uh, uh, the convent and be a nun, or they would leave in a scandalous sort of uh, sexually deviant way and become a, a prostitute or a whore, or if, even if they just moved out and lived on their own as a single woman, that would equate as well. So uh, it's very problematic, and you can see why why scholars and, and authors, etc., would want to start turning this over. And that's what Cisneros is doing with these stories. Um, all of the stories that we read have to do with, with women at various stages of, of their life. You know, from the very first part of the book where we read, you know, My Friend Lucy and and Eleven, which is a beautiful, beautiful, but sad children's story. Uh, it also shows you that as a young girl, the characters in these stories are, are learning, and they're very impressionable, and they're learning about, um, you know, what things are important. And, you know, you go on from there, and you look at the Barbies, uh, and and the, uh, what is it, Americans, where they're learning about how they're sort of less than cultural, the children, the voices in these stories, right? And, and you move through the, the more adolescent stories, the One Holy Night, which is a monumental story of this girl, young girl learning about her own sexuality and and how it's to be thought of as shameful and fearful and but yet for men the man in this story turns out to be you know a known uh, molester and and he becomes this this sort of infatuating figure for the character it's a very very um, I don't want to say you know confusing but it's it's a convoluted awakening for a young girl like this, who, who learns that she should be ashamed of herself, but then also begins to to see the fascination with this. You know, and you take this on into the, the later stories, the, the Eyes of Zapata, which, if you don't know, Zapata is one of the real-life Mexican revolutionary uh, generals. He was a, he a people's hero during the Mexican Revolution, and supposedly... Uh, well, not supposedly, m more than likely, had had many women uh, spread throughout Mexico as he traveled around during this time. And this story sort of, you know, imagines what that is. And the character, if you didn't catch it, the character who narrates this story is, is you know, at least implied that she is a bruja or a witch, somebody with strong powers. And, and she has... Um, very much, uh, Cisneros has very much placed that implication here that says that, you know, while the men are out there winning these battles and, and leading these people, the women are just as powerful in a lot of different ways. And then finally, you have um, the title story, the Woman Hollering Creek story, which is very much sort of, if you take all the characters from all of these stories, and, and by the way, there are only some very small crossovers, you know, some of them not, you know, you might see some of the characters uh, and their their descriptions appear in that, that uh, Little Miracles Kept Promises, the one that shows you all the church notes. Uh, if you look closely, some of those are perhaps people from earlier stories. But other than that, these stories are all standalone. Uh, so the title story, Woman Hollering Creek, positions this woman from Mexico, Cleophilas, uh, puts her across the border into the United States. So she's a Mexican woman who has been brought over uh, by her husband into the United States. And she grows up uh, in Mexico, not really... Um, 
knowing anything beyond her father's house, and here she is brought into her husband's house, just as we were talking about a minute ago. That's the way she leaves the house. And Cisneros positions her uh, between two women, uh, Soledad and Dolores. And if you can uh, decipher any Spanish that you've learned, Dolores is pains, and Soledad is solitude. And that's between these two is where she places herself because she's alone and she's in pain. Okay, And over the course of the story, we learn that her husband is, is neglectful and sort of abusive emotionally and, and really sort of uh, wants to, to confine his wife at home. But this woman becomes aware of, of her life as as a, a story that she can take control of. She's always constantly watching uh, and reading uh, you know, soap operas or telenovelas that she's drawing her life comparison from and she's seeing that this is not the case until she comes in contact with these sort of liberated women who would I, we would identify them as Chicanas. They're Mexican-American and they've been outside of that oppressive Latina uh, cultural identity. And, you know, for instance, she drives a truck and the people ask her, is this your husband's truck? No, it's my truck. You know, she, the, way, the, the way that she's dressed and, and the way that she acts, all of these things are, are much more progressive and liberated than the, the title woman, the Cleophilas, the woman who is very much in that... Marianismo, if you remember from the previous video, uh, role to her husband's macho, okay? And Feliz, the woman who drives the truck and, and comes to, to take her away and get her out of this situation, represents a, a Chicana identity that, that, that moves beyond that macho, Marianismo uh, tension and into something more. And so the ending scene of that story in fact, where she drives her away, and she's she's loud and she's brash, and she crosses over the the creek named Woman Hollering Creek, which is an actual creek in Texas. She crosses over and she lets out. I think it's called a Tarzan-like yell, a war cry, and she says, "I always do that," you know, and it's a way that 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 suggests that. She's not the weeping woman. She's not this sort of emotionally distraught and depressed and confined woman. She has moved beyond that and, and, and into this aggressive, sort of active uh, and very, very much forward-thinking woman who doesn't need the man to, to fulfill this part of her life. And this is what she passes on to Cleophilus. And it's very artfully written, in fact, in that last section where, where, where the, the yell sort of you know, transitions into Cleophilus's laughter when she's then later telling this story to her, her father. Um, this is the, the, the sort of one symbolic moment of the entirety of the book, that, that, that transition from from weak and, and emotionally distraught woman into something that is much more, you know, active and aggressive is, is the moment that, that sort of signifies all of what's going on in these stories, a growth pattern, an education, and an evolution into something beyond the, the confined woman uh, in, in this culture. Um, if you look at the other stories, you're going to see very similar um, you know, sort of uh, upturning of confined roles, right? Some of the stories we didn't read also will address this. Uh, Never Marry Mexican, that's a very, very uh, powerful story as well in terms of looking at that. Uh, and then I'm trying to think what was the other story that we read that I haven't mentioned. But uh, anyway, you will see those, those connections there as well. Um, Good luck with finishing uh, the book. Good luck on your quiz. And we'll see you on the next video.